I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor for today for tonight's uh, shiur. Tonight's shiur is sponsored by uh, Susan Jerkowitz. It's to commemorate the yard site of her mother, Elizabeth Biro, Ethel, but Baruch Leib HaKohen, Zichrona Livracha. So I would like to thank Susan for the sponsorship. Uh, the Neshama should have an Aliyah from our words of Torah tonight. And uh, thank you. Indeed, Kaddish was also said, so the Neshama should benefit from that as well. Uh, you know that there's actually uh, a tradition in some communities where Torah is not studied tonight. The Torah is our essence, right? Our identity, really. That's what has been keeping us going for the past 3,400 years. Uh, but there was a tradition in some kehilot, especially Hasidic kehilot, not to study Torah on the eve of the 25th of December. And it was known as Nittelnacht, Nittel, uh, which is a, a word that made it into Yiddish, but obviously originated in other languages. And for, for the mystics, it, it was an issue that related to not benefiting the neshama of the one that humanity or many are celebrating his birth tonight and tomorrow. So that is an explanation that's given why the Torah is not studied. Uh, there are more rational explanations to it that in many communities to make your way to the study hall on Xmas Eve would be very, very dangerous because the guy would go to mass and then they would get drunk and you would be in deep trouble. So therefore people would avoid, the norm was to avoid a journey outside to the study hall and thus Torah was not studied. And perhaps that's how the custom developed not to study Torah and then a mystical insight was given. Uh, not our discussion here tonight, but clearly uh, I, I, the reason it's not a practice I follow is because in the shivot that I studied, we studied, uh, or we were at least were encouraged to study Torah all times, and there was no indication at all that for Nittelnach you don't study. So I don't have such a tradition. What I do derive from it is uh, the fact that Torah study is considered in our tradition to be extremely beneficial for neshamos for souls. And uh, come a yard site to study Torah, especially if we gather here together, uh, no question it is meaningful, it is keeping a legacy alive, and actually send, sending benefits to the spiritual realm. Uh, concepts we don't really have the ability to wrap our head around, but we do have the right to turn to our tradition to guidance how to benefit neshama. So therefore our gathering here tonight and our studying here tonight should indeed be a, nisham, a benefit from the Shama of Etel, but Baruch Leib HaKohen. Okay, so our discussion tonight really relates to the fact that tomorrow is a fast day for those who are able to fast. Asar Vatevis is a minor fast day. Uh, so therefore, many people who take medications and they can't take it on an empty stomach, uh, we're not dealing here with Yom Kippur or Tisha B'Av, we're dealing with a minor fast day. So obviously you have to assess and we know what our priorities are in Judaism to take care of our health. Uh, for many like myself, God willing, you know, I'm going to fast the Ezra Sashem tomorrow. I plan to make it easier, easier on myself a little bit. And I'm going to do it Hashem, by waking up early, having a good bowl of oatmeal, and most probably a coffee as well. All that before 637. And... That's how uh, I plan to do it. But we want to study a little bit about this fast day, about Asara B'Tevet. What is it about? In other words, what should we be mindful of as we go through the day? If we have a few minutes that we could sit down, meditate for a few minutes, or perhaps if we could daven, what should we be thinking about? So to really appreciate Asara B'Tevet, we actually have to realize that it 
is considered day three of three dark days. Now, I'm giving you an update, unfortunately, 48 hours late. Uh, but in our tradition, and that's what we're going to discuss a little bit, the 8th of Tevet, the 9th of Tevet, and the 10th of Tevet are all considered days that are dark, that something occurred to us that we have to be mindful of, and things we could try to perhaps recognize that things are not in its ideal form, and therefore uh, upgrade, upgrade our behavior and become better people. So the way tradition teaches us this idea is a statement that we are told in the Talmud. And the Talmud tells us that uh, the Egyptian Greeks, the dynasty of Ptolemy, they forced rabbis into a room and they made them translate the Torah into Greek. Now, this is the first time that our tradition, our text, the text that gives us our identity, was translated against our will. In other words, we Jews, we Jews believe that we have actually a mission to humanity, right? We feel a responsibility to the human race. And that's what a good Jew is about, that we follow the teachings of Avraham Avinu Av Hamon Gaim. Jews are concerned about the welfare of humanity. It's really fundamental. Sometimes it's difficult because, there, because there's so much internal emphasis in our tradition. There's so much focus on our education and separating ourselves from humanity. It's needed, but at the same time, God forbid, it should not minimize the significance of every single human being for us Jews. And our concern for them is not just a physical concern, but even a spiritual concern. Right? We want a tikkun olam, we want to fix the world. We want the world to recognize that there's a higher being and there are things that we should be doing. There's things we should be appreciating as a result. Right, That's what Jews are about. There's a story about uh, one of the great mashgichim in the beginning of the 20th century in Europe. And he was a very sensitive individual. And he would know that when he would see his uh, Christian's neighbor, his Christian neighbors making their way to church, it would hurt him because he felt bad for them. In other words, he was concerned for them, not just physically, but spiritually well as well. And uh, for him, he wants them to practice the Noahide law. So it, it hurt him. So the idea of concern for humanity and reaching out to humanity and teaching them has a place in Judaism. But it has to be in a way, it has to be where we are established. When a gun is put to your head, you might corrupt the message. In other words, to go ahead and teach Torah. When we are in the land of Israel, where we are confident with what we are teaching, where we don't have to adjust anything because of a concern that there'll be repercussions if it's misunderstood, that is good. That is not just acceptable, but rather according to tradition, when they entered into the land of Israel, the Torah was written was Torah, Torah was written on stones for the purpose of inspiring humanity. So we want to inspire humanity when we have the home field advantage, when we have the confidence of we can do what we desire and teach it with teach it without adjustment. But to be brought down to Egypt and to be told, translate your tradition. So it's really handing it over where we know we, we lose control of the message. And therefore, our tradition teaches us on the eighth day of Tevet. The Torah was translated into Greek. The Septuagint, the first translation and all those Bibles that you see every single time you go to a hotel, a motel and you open the drawer and you see a Bible and you ask yourself, wow, that's interesting. I hear that every Shabbos. How do they have it in a foreign language? When did that start? It all started on the eighth day of Tevet because Talmai, Ptolemy the king, forced the Jews to do it. It was against their will. And tradition teaches us, It brought forth three days of darkness. So there's an event, one that we do not celebrate, one that we hope that the day Bezrat Hashem will come where we could return to teaching 
with the advantage of confidence, but on the 8th of Tibet, we should be mindful of it. But we, the tradition continues. And this actually appears in Shulchan Aruch, not that it's the first source that mentions it, but there's an oral tradition that goes back over a thousand years that these are days of darkness. And now when this text spells out the issue that occurred on the ninth of Tevet, the day that just passed, passed. So the text tells us, Betishabo, you want to know what happened on the ninth of Tevet? Lo noda ezehi atzara. Meaning something occurred, something that was not good, some tragic event occurred on that day, something sad at least, but we don't know what it is. It remains a mystery. What's that, what's that all about? So that's a, there's a lot of discussion, not our discussion here tonight. What exactly is the ninth of Tevet about? So later authorities, right? Later authorities note the following, that if you read carefully the slichot that we're going to be saying tomorrow, it, it makes reference to the fact that on the ninth of Tevet, was the day of the passing of Ezra HaSofer. Ezra HaSofer, the person who we give credit for the return for the second commonwealth, for the second temple, it's his yard site. Okay, that could be, it's true, but many authorities have a problem with it because why was there a desire to try to conceal that date? Meaning, if the text tells us that we don't know what happened, meaning we try to conceal, there's something hidden Regarding the tragic event of that day, uh, well, the mystery is if it's all it is is the passing of Ezra, why hide it, right? So there's another approach. There's another approach that identifies something tragic that occurred on the 9th of Tevet in the year 1066 in Granada, Spain. What occurred in 1066? in Granada, Spain, that was considered tragic. So uh, anyone that studied a little bit about uh, the, the golden age of Jews in Spain uh, knows very well that we had a very good relationship with the caliphate there even, with the Muslims. And I'm sure you've heard of the great Shmuel Hanagid, the visor, right? Who was actually a top general who was at the helm of a Muslim army. Uh, he was a poet and poet with poetry was extremely respected in Spain of the ninth and the 10th century when the Muslims, the educated Muslims and their version of Islam was present. Uh, he was identified uh, by, by, by the king. And there's a very long story about Shmuel Hanagid who is considered the most influential Jew uh, in the history of Muslim Spain, Shmuel Anagid. After his passing, and this is a person that had prestige, that had honor, had a position, had extreme power, uh, wealth, and uh, that brought forth a tremendous amount of, of support for Torah scholarship. After Shmuel Anagid's passing, his son Yosef took over the role of his father, also respected. Uh, but it, it appears that just as he had many friends in positions of power, this Yosef, the son of Shmuel and Agid, he had some enemies as well. And unfortunately, in late December of 1066, the 9th of Tevet, he was massacred with many, many other Jews in Granada, Spain. So there is a tradition, there's a tradition that's mentioned about a century afterwards, that there's a tradition that what we are commemorating on the 9th of Tevet is the passing of Yosef ben Shmuel Anagid. The only issue with this explanation is that the text that tells us that something occurred on the 9th, right, and it is something that we are concealing, predates those events, predates the 11th century. So there's a little bit of an issue with that explanation. So there are several authorities that seem, seem to indicate that there was an event on the 9th of Tevet 
that relates to Christianity, a religion we are familiar with, it relates to Christianity. So for example, one of the commentators notes that it is the day of the birth of Yeshu. Okay, that uh, JC was born on that day perhaps, but there's actually a very fascinating, a very, very fascinating tradition. There was a text that circulated for hundreds of years as a manuscript that was known as Toldot Yeshu. It was a Jewish tradition about events that occurred in the life of Yeshu Hanotri JC. Now, the reason it remains in a form of a manuscript is because it did not have a positive angle about Yeshu. And obviously in uh, 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 Christian Europe, you would not be wise to publish such a work. So therefore it remained in a form of a manuscript. In that text, in that text, in some of its versions, not all, it has a story of someone by the name of Shimon HaKalfus. Shimon, Shimon HaKalfus. This Shimon HaKalfus uh, was one of the rabbis of the era right after uh, the, the, or during the, we'll call it towards the end of the first century. And this Shimon Akalfus and the other rabbis were extremely concerned. Their concern was that this new movement is extremely similar to Judaism. But the problem is that this Christian movement with its similarities at the, at the same time, in its core, it's a belief that a specific individual is the Messiah, is going to return. And they struggled with this issue, how to preserve Judaism from the spread of this new faith that for many seems to be exactly the same as Judaism. And this is something we know from the Talmud as well, that the rabbis had to establish a blessing within the Amidah to go ahead and quote unquote, curse those who want to uproot Judaism because they were extremely concerned that this powerful new charismatic, this movement that is spreading like wildfire might hurt, might devastate, the Judaism that was going through a very harsh time. This is after the destruction of the temple. So they came up with a plan. So this is how it's presented in this Toldot Yeshu. That they came up with a plan to go ahead and place an agent within the new movement. Meaning to take one of the rabbis and he's going to join them. And the goal of this rabbi joining them was not, God forbid, that he believed in it. But rather for the sake of distancing them from Judaism and convincing them to make changes, big changes, changes that would be so significant that as a result, no one will no longer, no one would be confusing traditional Judaism with the new movement. So he convinces them to go ahead, this agent, right? This imposter who joins the disciples and he convinces them according to this text that you should go ahead and change from Shabbos to Sunday the holidays and provides for them a new list of holidays. And according to this text, his name of this Shimon HaKalfus in the way he appears among the Christians is Simon Peter or Saint Peter. This is how we are told. Now, Saint Peter himself, knowing that he's gonna be joining this group and will no longer be attached to traditional Judaism, Ask the rabbis that at least we should remember the day of his passing, meaning that Klal Yisrael should accept it upon themselves to remember him. So according to a tradition, this is a tradition that there's a great, a great rabbi by the name of Rav Baruch Tomim Frankel, a great rabbi of the late 18th, early 19th century writes that I found in a manuscript, a tradition that on the 9th of Tevet, Niftar, who passed away, this Shimon HaKalfus, this Shimon HaKalfus, Simon Peter or Saint Peter, Shehoshia at Israel, he brought forth salvation for the people of Israel for guiding Christianity away from Judaism. So that's why we remember him according to this tradition on the 9th of Tevet, a fascinating tradition 
and again, it does appear in this manuscript that's a thousand years old, and there are several of them. Uh, it, how it, can we verify the details, or was this something that you, the Jews perhaps came up with to deal with the struggle with Christianity? I don't know enough, uh, but a fascinating insight into this day it is. And when we say that he, you know, directed Judaism or directed Christianity away from Judaism, I don't know to what extent. I don't know if he paskin that if you have two centimeters of snow, then it's considered a white Xmas. Like, I don't know how far and how detailed according to the tradition, but an interesting insight indeed. But what's relevant for us and what we're studying here today is really Asara Bativet, the third, the third dark day. What are we commemorating on Asara Bativet, which is tomorrow? So what led to the destruction of the first temple was a siege. And while this siege of Jerusalem is taking place, right, about uh, two and a half years before the destruction of the first temple, there are Jews already in Babylonia. There are Jews in Babylonia. And they even have a spiritual guide. So the Jews in Babylonia, while there is still a temple in Jerusalem, the first temple, are guided by Yechezkel Hanavi, Ezekiel, Yechezkel. And we are told in the 24th chapter of Yechezkel that God Almighty communicates with him. Vayidvar Hashem Eli, God communicates with the prophet. And we are told that this occurs Bachodesh HaAsiri, on the 10th month, Tevet. Ba'asor lachodesh on the 10th day of the month. And God says to him, listen here. K'tov lecha et shem hayom. Record this day. Record this day. Et etzem hayom hazeh. Remember this actual day. Remember these words, by the way. Etzem hayom hazeh. Are interesting words which we're going to analyze again. But what God tells Yechezkel is you should know right now right, hundreds of kilometers away in the land of Israel, on this day, Samach Melech Bavel al Yerushalayim. Yechezkel, you know what's happening now far away? There's a siege on Jerusalem. And, he, and God Almighty tells Yechezkel, record the day, communicate the fact that you have this information with others, and then when in a few months from now, the news is going to reach Babylonia that there is a siege on Jerusalem. And the siege actually started on the 10th of the 10th month, the 10th of Tevet. The Jews in Babel will recognize that you are a true prophet. And you know, Yechezkel needed it because as Yechezkel was preaching values of Torah, that values of self-improvement, Values of recognizing that when things are not the way they should be, God expects us to become better. There were other people. There were false prophets. And the false prophets were very big into worry not. Everything's good. Things are random. Things are good. Don't worry about self-improvement. It's not necessary. So Yechezkel had this significant struggle. And he needed a card. He needed evidence where he could show the people of Israel that he is connected to the higher being. That information that he provides is indeed true prophecy. So this was the tool. This was the day by Yechezkel. And again, there's no communication, right? 2,500 years ago, he did not see it on WhatsApp or he did not get an email that there's a siege on Jerusalem. The only way for him to know the date, weeks, if not months, before the news reached was through communication with the higher being. So this was the day of the siege, but it is also a day that reminds us that there are prophets in Israel, that there are people that communicate this idea of self-improvement. And that's really the beginning of our journey to appreciate and understand the day. Now, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is a very unique Asara Tevet, it's on a Friday. It doesn't happen too often. Asara Tevet on a Friday doesn't happen too often. And what's also interesting is that it doesn't occur with any other fast day. 
right? It come, you know, when it comes to Tisha B'Av, it never will be on a Friday. Shiva Sarbitam Nuz will never be on a Friday. Not some Gedalias. There's something unique about this day. Now, there's actually a, a, a struggle among halachic authorities how to deal with the first minutes of Shabbat tomorrow. Because we have a rule, you're not supposed to enter into Shabbat starving, right? Shabbat is a day to celebrate. It's special. It connects us. It brings us together. It makes us mindful of our identity, of the essence of creation. You're supposed to celebrate. And how does a Jew celebrate? Obviously, by not being hungry and by eating a good meal. So to enter into Shabbat starving is problematic. So there's a dispute in the Talmud between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yossi what to do. Rabbi Akiva says, listen here, you know, you got, you got, you got to eat on Friday before Shabbat, not to enter the Shabbat me'une, afflicted. Rabbi Yossi disagrees. And the Talmud tells us that halachically, you're supposed to fast the whole day. But it's still unclear among authorities. Is Rabbi Yossi telling us that it's a must or if it's okay? And also there's a question among questions among authority. Let's say tomorrow, right? Uh, the sun sets. We wait a few more minutes after sunset uh, when it comes to a regular fast day. But on a regular Friday night, we, we make Kiddush and we could go ahead and do it right after sunset. Can I make Kiddush early? So although in the bulletin, I did note that regarding Toronto, uh, we should wait until 5.20. And that seems to be the minute in Toronto, which is about 33 minutes after sunset. Technically speaking, if you fast tomorrow and come already 5.12 and you're hungry or thirsty, there's good reason, good reason to go ahead and make Kiddush already. And the reason is, according to the Gaon of Vilna, Already, without doubt, 18, 20 minutes after sunset, you could consider it night. So according to the Vilna Gaon, if you, if you would have him present here and ask him tomorrow at 512, is it okay to make Kiddush? He would say to you, it's not just okay, it's a mitzvah because it's Shabbos and you're hungry. So clearly, uh, we have the great authorities to rely on to, be able to shave a few minutes off. So I did publish 520. That's what other shuls did as well but I give a green light in case of need already by 5.12 when it comes to tomorrow. Now, uh, a great rabbinic halachic authority of the early 14th century says to us that you need to understand asarabe tevet. Yes, it's a minor fast, but in some ways it carries more weight than other fast days. And you know why? Because if you look carefully at the words in the book of Yechezkel, as Yechezkel is told by God that there's a siege in Jerusalem right now, God uses the word Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh. And those words ring a bell, Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh actually appear regarding Yom Kippur. So therefore, writes the Abu Draham, Rabbi David Abu Draham, that you should know that if theoretically our calendar would have had a Sarabit Tevet on Shabbat, we would have fasted even on Shabbat due to those key words. So true, we don't have that due to the fact that the calendar works it out that a Sarabit Tevet will never, never fall on Shabbat. Nevertheless, it gives us a little bit of an understanding why we have that Friday and into Shabbat of fasting. So it indicates uh, a, a significance of the day. So, so far what we have is that we should be mindful on Asara Tevet that number one, it's a day that began the process of destruction. And it's important to remember that the process of destruction of the first temple, which carries many dates on the calendar to remind us of it, it all starts Asara Tevet. So it's the beginning of that sad journey of our history and perhaps a good day to be mindful of how we could upgrade as a nation due to the many tragedies we face. So that's piece of information number one. But what I really would like to discuss uh, tonight uh, relates to Klal Israel's reaction to the Shoah. 
how did we as a nation address the Shoah? In other words, in, in Jewish tradition, when there's tragedy, uh, you address it, a day of commemoration. What about the Shoah? Is there a day to commemorate the Shoah? And if you ask me, well, what does that have to do with Asara Betevet? So what we're going to see very soon is that Asara Betevet at one point, and in some communities even today, is considered a little bit of a Yom HaShoah. What's the history behind it? So you have to re return our people to 1944, 1945. Already in 1944, there's an understanding in the land of Israel that something very devastating is taking place in Europe. So I, I remember as a kid that I was interacting with someone and they, they were sharing with me a story of uh, the Ness, the Ness that occurred in the land of Israel that, Ro that uh, Rommel did not conquer Israel when he was traveling in North Africa towards Germany. And there was a concern in the old Yishuv in the 1942, 1943, that the Nazis will arrive in the land of Israel, but it was the hand of God that stopped it. So, I, you know, as a little kid, I'm 11 years old. I hear a story in school. I'm inspired. I turned to my father and I said to my father, wouldn't have, wouldn't have it been very devastating if the Nazis would have arrived in Israel? You know, it would have been devastating. Thank God it didn't. And my father's reaction was, what the Nazis did was devastating. In other words, you know, it's nice to have a little story of the hand of God that prevented the Nazis from making their way into Eretz Israel, but my goodness, let's not forget what they did do, right? And you know, my grand, my father grew up in that, you know, the generation knowing that his grandparents, uh, you know, grandfather, you know, shot to death by the Nazis, and like many, like many people here. So obviously, the question is, should there not be a day to commemorate? And among the great rabbinic figures who addressed the issue and struggled with it was obviously Rabbi Tzchak Isaac Herzog. Rav Herzog, we talked about him in the past, chief rabbi of Ireland, eventually makes his way to Eretz Yisrael in a, an educated, very inspiring, very impressive individual, incredible stories and even footage about him. Uh, you all know that uh, his son Chaim Herzog was the president of Israel. Many of you know his grandson, uh, Buzhi uh, uh, Herzog named after him. So he felt deep down that it would be appropriate to establish a day of fasting, of prayer to commemorate the devastation of the Shoah. Now, as he started sending out feelers among different rabbis, the reaction was, especially from the Haredi rabbis, that it is unacceptable, it is unacceptable to establish a new day. Uh, the Briskarov, Ravelville of Brisk, used a, a very harsh language. And he said that you should know that just as there's a prohibition of Baal Tosif, of adding to Torah, so too our tradition has handed us specific fast days. It would be considered inappropriate to add another fast day. That's what the Briskarov said. Now, Ramosha Feinstein actually was one of the authorities that addressed the question. And he notes that, listen, obviously we have to remember the Shoah, but the appropriate day to remember to, to remember would be on Tisha B'av. So in Ramosha's words, Lachen tzarich laskiram, it is a must for us Torah Jews to remember the Shoah, bakinot de omrim betisha be'av. When we say the kinot on Tisha B'av, add one for the Shoah as we do here every single year. We follow what Ramosha tells us. But establishing an additional day, Ramosha sees it as problematic because the way Ramosha views it, all destruction and all tragedies and all pogroms and all massacres are the byproduct of the destruction of the temple. So there's no need for an additional day because we have Tisha B'Av. On Tisha B'Av, we commemorate all of Jewish history. And as we read the keynote, we obviously travel through the pains, the agony 
of our history. Now, Rav Herzog, Rav Herzog felt differently. And Rav Herzog wondered, wait a second, I don't understand. In 1648, 1649, where the Chalnitsky massacres occurred, where we lost perhaps, perhaps 100,000 people, which is a terrible number, but that's 1 60th of the Shoah. And nevertheless, the rabbis of that time felt, the great rabbis of the, of the 17th century felt that it is appropriate to an establish a day. And Jews in Europe, up until the Shoah, were fasting on the 20th of Sivan. So therefore, Rav Herzog wonders if this was something that was acceptable then for a tragedy that did not reach the level of the Holocaust, I don't understand how much more so would there be a need for a date on the Shoah. So Rav Herzog was driven to establish a date. That's what his feelings were in the mid-1940s as the news reached the world of what the Nazis did to us. But it appears that he sensed that if these great rabbinic figures like the Briskarov and like the Chazonish will not be on board, it's not going to take hold. So therefore, he made a decision that what we're going to do is we're going to take one of the fast days and make it into a Yom HaShoah as well. The commemoration of the Shoah is going to take place on a fast day. And in ideal time, due to the fact that the liberation of several of the camps occurred in January of 1945, close to Asarabetivet. So therefore, it was determ- he was determined and le- as the leader of the Rabbanut in Israel established that the day of Asarabetivet will actually be a Yom Zikaron a Yom Zikaron for this Korban. And by the way, this is not random that it relates to Asara B'tevet. Asara B'tevet, 2,600 years ago, was the beginning of the destruction. What we are hoping for in the mind of Rav Herzog was that the destruction came to an end with the Shoah because now Bar Hashem, we have Jewish presence in the land of Israel, a Jewish state, and hopefully the beginning of the fear of the full redemption. And therefore, to come for full circle, we should commemorate the tragedies on Asara B'tevet. And therefore, Rav Herzog establishes that we're going to go ahead and have people gathering on Asara B'tevet. Now remember, this is not just something that is needed for future generations to study the Shoah, to commemorate the Shoah. We are a nation that's hurting. Do you know how many people were saying Kaddish or needed to say Kaddish, right? I'm, I'm sure I'm looking here at people that their parents said Kaddish for victims of the Shoah. They needed a day, many of them, because they had no idea when they lost their parents, right? Speak to Hungarian Jews and they'll tell you that they know that it was sometime around Shavuos, right? But it's sometime. And well, what about for the Polish Jews that they don't know when at all, they have no idea at all when they lost their parents, right? These are windows. What day do they say Kaddish? Rav Herzog says, Asara B'tevet should be the day. Asara B'tevet should be that day of saying the Kaddish. Now, what he, this was a, a, a flyer that was uh, put up in late 1940s, where the Rabbanuta Rashid declares that Yom Chalalei HaShoah, we have a day that has been established as a day to commemorate, I don't know if we should call them victims, or the ones that, was mass- that were massacred on the Shoah. Yom HaAsiri B'tevet, Nikva Al Yadenu, it was established, for this generation and for future generations as well. For all those who were killed by the Nazis in Europe. He talks about Ashana Kibshanot, the crematorium. And you could read the rest of what he is telling us here. But for me, there is one detail. There's one detail that is meaningful. 
because it was established not just the date where we're going to commemorate, not just the date we're going to study Mishnayot and say Kaddish Lilu Nishmoseyen and light a yardsight candle, but rather a location because Ya'aleha Kahal to where? Lehartzion, Hartzion, the Tfilat Arvit. What is Hartzion? If you uh, have had the privilege of walking the streets of Yerushalayim, there's a Shar Tzion, and there's an area called Har Tzion, which perhaps today is a little bit neglected, but it was considered a very significant location for 19 years. From 1948 till 1967, when our nation did not have access to the old city of Yerushalayim, Hart Sion became very special because it was the closest location to the Temple Mountain to the Kotel. And for Jews, it became the place where they could feel that physical connection. Unfortunately, nothing closer than that. that. Uh, Shazar, uh, President Shazar actually had a little room designated there for himself to meditate, to pray, to write, to study, to read, because there was an, an understanding that this is the closest that we could get. There's a little Shoah Museum. There's a place called Martefa Shoah that I remember visiting a few decades ago in Har Tzion. Har Tzion, for a hurting nation, a hurting nation from the past, a hurting nation from the fact that they don't have access to Yerushalayim, to the Kotel, became their Makom Kedusha, became their, a holy place for them. And therefore, Rav Herzog says, we're going to make our way to Har Tzion, Litfilat Arvit. That became the significant location to commemorate the events. And by the way, it, so here we have the date of this specific event, Biyom HaRishon, Asara Betevet, Tavshin Yud Gimel. That is we're going to, when we're going to go ahead and have a Azkara HaKlalit Lakdoshim. That's what's going to occur. Now, what happens in Israel? So the Rabbanut in Israel has a little bit of a challenge. You know what their challenge is? And I think, thank God, the challenge has been minimized to some extent. But the Rabbanut in the early years had a little bit of a problem that they did not have really a significant following. In Haredi communities, already in those days, the Rav Rashi was not the authority they turned to for guidance. It was one of their gdolim, meaning where of Herzog, with all due respect, uh, what, for many of the Haredim, was not the gadolador, was not the leader of the generation. They would turn to the Chazonish. The secular in Israel in the early years, uh, the rabbinate didn't really talk to them. Yes, you know, you have to accept Ben Gurion had to accept to deal with them, but not for guidance. And as a result, even though the Rabbanut established the day, established the day of Asarab Tevet as a day of remembering the Shoah, the Knesset ignored it. And the Knesset, due to the fact that the, in the early days of the state of Israel, where when they talked about the Shoah, they talked about it as Yom HaShoah VeHagvura, the day that we commemorate the Holocaust, but also the bravery of those who fought against them, like in the war of Segedo. So therefore they tried to find a date that was close uh, to the rebellion or to the uprising in the war of Segedo. So therefore they wanted a Nisan and the 27th of Nisan was chosen. And by the way, for many religious people in Israel, the Yom HaShoah on the 27th of Nisan is problematic because Nisan is a month actually of celebration. You don't establish a day of commemoration of victims of the Shoah during the month of celebration. So this was a little bit hard for Rav Herzog that on the one hand, he did not have the support from you know, the Torah institutions. And then the secular institutions did not uh, give him the support as well. And as a result, Yom HaShoah Sarabe Tevet almost vanished. I say almost because there are still people today who are gonna be saying Kaddish in the land of Israel tomorrow for the victims of the Shoah. 
and the day has a new name. It's called Yom HaKadish HaKlali, the day of the general Kaddish. And if a person, and there are people up until this day in Eretz Yisrael, in a couple hours from now when the sun rises there, there are people who are going to be saying Kaddish for the victims of the Shoah, for those who do not have a date or an idea when this relative parish that was killed by the Nazis. So in some ways, I think personally that among the things we should be mindful of on Asara Tevet is the Shoah itself. And not just what the victims went through, but the ability of those who survive and those who say Kaddish to rebuild and the, the 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 strength that was needed you know we, we are in times of challenge but quite often i have the privilege of talking to people who went through bigger challenges who went through the darkness of the shoah and they are the greatest educators and reminders uh, to put things in perspective and for us for my generation to have the privilege of interacting with such people that survived with faith those are the heroes. And if tomorrow is a day that, if, that if, even if one Jew would be tomorrow saying Kaddish for someone of the Shoah because they don't remember the day, I think we all have an obligation to be mindful of it. They are remembering those. They are remembering those that do not have a, a place of burial. We don't know the date of their passing. I think we have an obligation to remember it as well. But the little bit of the bright side of all this is the events of Yom HaKadish HaKlali, the events of the first Yom HaShoah relate to Har Zion, to a location that was not in the old city of Yerushalayim, a location where we really settled in essence, that we identified it as the closest we can get. And Baruch Hashem today, Baruch Hashem today, we have access to Yerushalayim. You know, perhaps right now we can't get on a plane, uh, but with prayer and faith and uh, working vaccine, we're going to go ahead and make it one day to the land of Israel. And when we have the privilege of walking those streets, uh, let's be grateful that we're in, you know, rebound mode as a nation. That if for 19 years our ancestors couldn't get beyond that area, uh, we Baruch Hashem could go far beyond it. And therefore, when I read this poster and I see that the closest they could get is Har Zion, and we Baruch Hashem could get Yerushalayim, it's also something to be mindful and grateful on this day. So hopefully we developed a little bit of an appreciation of the three days, hopefully a little bit of what Asara Tevet is about. And even those who are not fasting should try to, you know, be mindful of what it is. There's a discussion in Israel today, in the past few days, in the Avinu Malkeinu that we're going to be saying tomorrow morning, uh, the traditional wordings is Avinu Malkeinu Mena Magefa Mina Chalatenu. We turn to the Almighty in prayer to please prevent a Magefa, a plague, from our nation. And the question being asked from great rabbinic figures is perhaps this year we should adjust it from Mena, prevent, to Atzor, Atzor. God Almighty, atzor magefa minachalatenu. Stop it. And it, it, it's, it's a powerful discussion when there is a discussion that relates to making a change due to a tragic situation. This is something that is, uh, is new for me, right? I haven't had that ever. In other words, if there are discussions in Jewish tradition about making adjustments, it always has been about good things. In other words, there's a discussion when it comes to Tisha B'av, how do we say in Nachem that Jerusalem is a desolate city when it's not? It's a beautiful discussion because we're talking about circumstances that change to the better. And here it was a little bit painful to read that we're having a halachic discussion about an adjustment due to a tragedy. So, Whatever their answer is, I don't know. You know. There's no clear guidance that we got if we should change it from mena to atzor. And even if we say the traditional words, avinu malkenu mena magefa, prevent, 
it means prevent it from spreading more. Uh, but obviously, it's a time to reflect more than any other time. It's a time to reflect about our journey as a nation. It's also a time to reflect that due to the fact that we have responsibility to humanity, our prayers should be for the sake of humanity. And uh, let's utilize, utilize the day tomorrow in a good way. So I would like, again, to take this opportunity to thank Susan for sponsorship. And the Shem of your mother should have indeed a benefit from our words and hopefully from our actions on this very significant day of Asara Betevet. It's an opportunity to wish everyone also a good Shabbos. And remember, uh, Shabbos, although it's every single week, it's the most significant of all. And it should be a very, very meaningful one, a time to recharge and reconnect. Thank you again. Thank you everyone for participating. It's always appreciated. And hopefully we benefited and learned something. Thank you. And we're going to unmute everyone.